There really is a day for everything. But when God set up Israel's calendar, he was a bit more picky about what got put into the dates for his calendar. He would set their time according to his purposes. And the Old Testament law is a reflection of that. That's exactly what he did there. There were three big festivals that the people had to attend. There was sort of a three-line whip for them to come. There was unleavened bread, i.e. Passover, the Feast of First Fruits, and the Feast of Weeks, also called the Feast of Ingathering. We see this in Exodus 23. Let me just read to you a few verses from there. Exodus 23, 14 to 17. Three times in the year you shall keep a feast to me. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. As I commanded you, you shall eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib. For in it you came out of Egypt. None shall appear before me empty-handed. You shall keep the feast of the harvest of the first fruits of your labour of what you sow in the field. You shall keep the feast of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in from the field the fruit of your labour. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God. Well, last time we looked at the Feast of First Fruits that's mentioned there. We'll look at the Passover around Easter time, but this week we're going to look at the Feast of Ingathering, in other words, the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. So we're going to start with the Old Testament. That's our first heading, the Old Testament. You'll find out they're just as imaginative as last time. Um, but the Feast of Weeks, despite being one of the main three festivals, sorry, there's no, I forgot to put them up on the screen, so it's fine. Um, I think we'll be able to cope. Um, they're not too, uh, too uh, intellectual. Old Testament, there you go. Um, the Feast of Weeks, despite being one of the three main festivals, appears only once outside the law in the Old Testament. And that's only during the time of Solomon to say that it actually happened which sort of implies that it didn't always actually happen throughout a lot of Israel's history. There's really not a lot to go on other than that period where it's sort of a high point of the Old Testament. So what does the law itself say? Well, in Hebrew, the festival is normally called Shavuot, meaning weeks, which is why we call it the Feast of Weeks. It was a festival that happened seven weeks, 50 days to be exact, after the Feast of first fruits that we talked about last time. That's why it's sometimes referred to as Pentecost. Pentecost is a Greek word for 50th. That's why it's got the penty bit like a, 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 pent, a, a pentagon. Confusingly, it's also called the Day of First Fruits once, and it's also called the Festival of Ingathering in that reading we had in Exodus. It's got a lot of names for one event. But ingathering is the main idea. Whereas the Festival of First Fruits was about the precocious beginnings of the harvest, the Feast of Weeks was a bit about ingathering the whole thing, reaping the whole harvest. And it was usually around this time that the wheat harvest was ready to be wheat, uh, reaped. The early one was usually the barley, which ripens earlier, but this one was the one of the wheat at, at the end of the season. And the gathering in of the wheat was to be a celebration of God's goodness to them. They were to rejoice in God's gift to them. So Deuteronomy 16, 11, speaking about this very festival, it says, You shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your towns, the sojourner, the fatherless and the widow who are among you, at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. It was a festival of rejoicing, of joy. And there are a few mentions in the Bible of how people rejoiced as at the harvest, as, as when they brought it in. Why was it 50 days after the last one? Well, on one level, that was when the, 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 the harvest was due, but also it's seven sevens, it's seven weeks, a wonderful holy number. And it was to happen after that seven sevens. The same happened in years too in Israel. Uh, after seven weeks of years, it says in Leviticus 23, there was to be a year of jubilee a year of celebration, all debts would be cancelled, all Israel's slaves would be freed, all land purchased returned to its original owner. It was to be a wonderful new beginning for the nation. Well, here we have a miniature every year, a new beginning, a celebration of all that God has done. The festival also over time became associated with the giving of the law. 
In Exodus, the Israelites arrived at Mount Sinai five days before this feast happened. We know that uh, the giving of the law is at least three days later. So it is plausible that God speaking to them from the mountain happened on this day. Uh, we can't be sure of that, but it's certainly possible. But it means in modern Judaism, that's often the focus of this festival. Given that Jews globally are less agriculturally based, it tends to be a celebration of the giving of the law. I also found out that the book of Ruth, which we've been studying in home groups, uh, is read by modern Jews uh, on, this, uh, on this day. Given its links with the harvest and the gleaning, we saw that, didn't we, in the little bit afterwards as well, about leaving those fields. Uh, I just thought that's a lovely detail, isn't it, to include that Ruth gets associated uh, with this festival. And the festival itself, as we had in our reading, was to be kept with a tribute offering of new grain made with leaven. Leaven's not always bad, it just spreads as a first fruit offering, first fruits of wheat rather than barley. A first a burnt offering of seven lambs, one bull and two rams. Burnt offering, if you remember back to our series on offerings, was to do with the removal of God's wrath. A sin offering of one male goat, sin offering was to do with purification. And a peace offering of two male lambs, those the worshipper could eat with their family and others and celebrate together uh, with a feast. It's nearly a full house of offerings. The only one that's missing is a recompense offering, which was only offered when something of God's had been damaged or misused, but that wasn't really relevant at this point. But it was to be a day that was set apart. No work was to be done on it. It was a day to gather and to worship. That would be proclaimed by the priest. And that's basically all we have from the Old Testament. That's all that we're given and a bit of common practice. So how is this picked up in the New Testament? That's the second heading, New Testament. There we go. Well, we know that this in the New Testament is the time when the Spirit uh, comes upon the church. Some see it as the church's birthday. I've never been a fan uh, of that phrase, but it certainly is a new birthday. Um, and it's no coincidence that God chose to send the Spirit on the church at this time. Jesus himself said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The giving of the Spirit was to enable the church to be Christ's witnesses across the world. When we couple this with other things Jesus says, the inference becomes obvious. So Luke 10 verse 2, and he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. That is what is happening at Pentecost. God is sending out his laborers into the harvest. And he's equipped them by his Holy Spirit to be witnesses there. I mean, that's why the first gifts that we see are miraculously speaking in other languages. And Peter suddenly being able to preach like a pro. That's all part and parcel, isn't it, of God giving them these gifts so that the gospel can go out. It's because the harvest has begun. Pentecost is the beginning of a new harvest, a global harvest that we now, too, are part of, equipped by his spirit to go out into the world. I suspect, I can't prove this, but I suspect the reason that leaven is included in this offering uh, when it's not included in the others, is to do with the growth and the increase of the kingdom. That's what leaven does, isn't it? So Jesus does speak occasionally about leaven positively. So Luke 13, 20 to 21. And again, again he said to them, shall what, what shall I compare the kingdom of God? It is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Basically that one, and this one here, in Leviticus, they're the only positive mentions of leaven in the whole of scripture that I can find anyway. This is about the explosive growth of the kingdom by the Spirit. We're also told too uh, that we're given the first fruits of the Spirit at this point at Pentecost, which might explain that confusion in the Old Testament where there's a sense in which this is also the first fruits too. But here it's first fruits of the Spirit, not first fruits from the dead. The Spirit is the deposit guaranteeing our inheritance, the fullness of the Spirit in glory. We get the first fruits now. And as it is the season of the Spirit, 
it also begins a season of rejoicing. Again, the Spirit is associated with joy. He's the joy giver in our hearts and causes us to rejoice in Christ. We don't live in a period of mourning, do we, but of rejoicing. Paul in Romans 14, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the age we live in, isn't it? Even the association with the law fits as the spirit at Pentecost begins to write the law of God on our hearts rather than on tablets of stone. The spirit there falls as fire at Pentecost, not on a mountain or on the fiery pillar, but on believers themselves. This is the spirit being poured out on all flesh, as Peter puts it, quoting Joel. But what about now? How do we keep the Feast of Weeks? That's our next heading, now. There you go, very exciting. Um, well, we can talk about Pentecost on Pentecost Sunday. I think that's a good thing. I don't think we're obliged to, but we can do. As with the Feast of First Fruits, though, the application in the New Testament goes from the external observance of events to the internal application of principles. We keep the feast as we engage in mission at home and abroad as we see many Pentecosts happening across the globe, as we hear the uh, people hearing the good news of Jesus, and they believe and receive the Holy Spirit, as we become involved with the ingathering of God's people across the world, as we pray, as we witness, as we see people come to Christ, we keep the Feast of Weeks. What are the sacrifices we present? Well, interestingly, people in the New Testament Paul again in Romans, Romans 16, 15, and 16. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder, because of the grace uh, given to me by God to be a minister of Christ to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God, so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Paul sees the Gentile believers as his offering to God, an offering sanctified by the Spirit, he brings them as an offering to God in his mission to the world. They are his worship to God in one sense. And we also keep the feast as we display the fruits of the Spirit, especially the fruit of joy. Yes, we mourn for our sin, but our general demeanour should be one of joy. So Mark chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. Christ is present with us by his spirit. He promises not to leave us alone, and the bridegroom remains in that sense. So this is not a time of fasting and of mourning, but of rejoicing, of new wine. That's what they think the disciples are drunk with on Pentecost. There is a sense of joy, of excitement, of awe and wonder in the disciples as they receive the Spirit, brought about by the Spirit's power. And as we see in Acts, it doesn't mean that they're not serious about things and they see everything sort of lightly. Equally, it doesn't mean they go around with a permanent smile on their face. But it does mean something. Their whole demeanour changes with the coming of the Spirit. I want to ask us this evening, do we show that same change? I was once challenged by a Christadelphian. Christadelphians don't believe that the Spirit is present in believers. I was challenged by a Christadelphian to prove that I had the Spirit. Where are the signs, she said? Where are the miracles? I pointed her to the fact that even the early Christians, not all of them could do miracles. That's why they were often called the signs of the apostles in Acts 5 and 2 Corinthians 12. But all believers, all believers without exception, were changed in their character in their outlook, in their very being. The Spirit brought joy and peace and hope and righteousness. And as we live that out, as we live out that joy, we keep the Feast of Weeks. Our hearts rejoice as at the harvest time. Isaiah 9, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest. That's us. So what is today? Well, it's not jellyfish day. It's not sandwich day. 
To quote Psalm 118, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Or to quote 2 Corinthians 6, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So let's live like those things are true because they are. And in doing so, let's keep the feast of weeks. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the gift of your spirit. Father, thank you that he lives in us. And Father, he enables us to witness to Christ. Father, he changes us on the inside. And Father, we long for that change to increase. Father, we long to be more like the Lord Jesus. We long to be more effective in our witness. Father, thank you, though, that this gift is given to us. Father, it's, it's something that we have already. So, Father, pray that the Spirit would have sway in our lives. Father, pray that we would listen to his word and live according uh, to what he has said. Father, empower us by your Spirit to do your will. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.